Hi ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs and today we're going to be talking about a ship that's really special. One of the reasons this ship means a lot to me is that when I first started my business in 2018, people started to write to me saying that they'd actually served on the P&O fleet. And one of the ships that most of them had served on was the Chusan. So by accident, I've actually accumulated this massive collection of stories of people who had sailed and served on board from engineers to purses to deck officers and all kinds of things. So by coincidence, I've kind of built up this uh, little collection of Chusan related memorabilia and stories. So it's a really interesting ship. It always surprises me that some of the most famous ships and the ones that we talk about most are those that didn't make it, those that sank and didn't have successful careers. Chusan is one of these ships that had a really, really successful career but nobody really knows about it. So today, let's fix that. I've just recently finished drawing the ship, and I'm going to give you a tour around. Just after the Second World War, P&O found themselves in charge of a fleet that was largely outdated. Not only that, but they'd also lost quite a few ships in combat. They realised they needed a new fleet of ships for the new age, and so, as early as 1946, they were ordering liners. One of the first was Chusan. She was ordered in 1946, launched in 1949, and delivered in 1950. She was built by the master shipbuilders Vickers Armstrong in Barrow. There's no doubt they were immensely proud of their ship. She was actually fairly large. She had an internal volume of 24,215 gross registered tons. She was about 673 feet long. She also had a fairly wide beam, 85 foot 2 inches. At the time, P&O had two major lucrative routes. The first was the Australia route. And typically it would follow this path. Departing Tilbury docks in London, the ships would go through the Mediterranean to the Suez Canal. Stop at Arden, then Bombay, to Colombo, in what is present day Sri Lanka. And then they would swing southeast for Fremantle in Australia, Adelaide, Melbourne, which is where I am, Sydney, and then Brisbane. But the second major route was the Far East route. This one was identical for the first few stops, but then typically after Colombo, they'd branch off for Singapore, Malaya, Hong Kong, and eventually Yokohama, Japan. And actually, Chusan was one of the first P&O ships to actually reinstate stopping at Japan after the Second World War. So Chusan was built for the Far East service. She was also the biggest ship that would ever be put on that service by the line. Now that context out of the way, why don't I start with the tour? Just getting an overall look at her, she's just one of the most beautiful ships I think that the line built. Vickers were master shipbuilders, there's no doubt, and they made very elegant, sleek liners. And she was a spectacular ocean-going ship. She also had a couple of aces up her sleeve, which I'll show you in a minute. So starting at the stern here, I like to say that the flags on my drawings tell a little bit of a story. So you can see here that the captain on this particular voyage is not Royal Navy Reserve, because otherwise he'd be able to fly the blue ensign. Here he's flying the red duster, the red ensign instead. Slightly forward of this, you've got an after steering station. And this could have been used in, say, docking procedures. You had a compass, binnacle, a ship's wheel, and an engine order telegraph. I love the design of this uh, stern gallery type thing where you've got three or four levels of promenade. This was a design cue that Vickers implemented on most Piano and Orient ships from all the way back with Orama in 1924 through to the 50s and 60s. So one way you can tell that this is a slightly later depiction of Trusan is two things. First of all, this green boot topping applied on top of her anti-foul. That was implemented after 1966 when P&O merged with Orient Line. But another way that you can tell is this really funky striped deck furniture. You can see this in photographs all over the ship. It's very distinctive. Just down here you can see that part of this promenade has got a canvas screen stretched across it. That's actually the children's play space and behind it you can just see some double doors that would have led through to the children's playroom. The canvas screen would have protected them from the hot sun in the Indian Ocean and the tropics. Looking up here, you can see that Chusan had a lot of cargo handling equipment. That's because she was expected to haul large amounts of freight and cargo long distances. You can see one cargo hatch here, but there are actually two more. One here, and one here. The other two are flush with the deck, which actually gives the passengers slightly more space. Oh, this is a great little point. I had no idea what these were when I first started seeing them in photographs of Trusan. Luckily, because she was in service until relatively recently, we can ask former passengers and crew questions about this kind of thing. So I asked a former officer what this was. Was it an air scoop or a ventilator? 
It's actually a little shelter cubby house thing for winch operators when they were handling cargo equipment to protect them from the sun. And she's covered in them. Anywhere you see a winch, you'll see some of these little shelters. Chusan had quite a few lifeboats. They were about 31 feet long, motorized, and they were each designed to take about 100 people. If you look really closely, you'll see on the after part of each lifeboat, there's a green nameplate with gold lettering saying Chusan. Now you might think that's a really oddly specific detail to point out, and how could I possibly know what color they were when most photographs of the ship are in black and white? Just so happens, I've got one. This was given to me by one of Chusan's former persons, and I have to say it's one of the things that I value most in my ocean liner collection. You just think of all the places this went, you know what I mean? Moving on to midships, you're going to see a lot more of this furniture scattered behind this uh, big glass screen. This is actually the first class games deck. So this is where passengers could have played deck tennis and all kinds of things. It was a fairly big space, you see it in use in a lot of, uh, in a lot of footage. But you can just see behind it all these doors and things. This is where they would have kept awnings, canvas screens, but also sports equipment for the games deck. And then we get to one of the most iconic features of Chusan, which is a massive funnel. You can see it standing on top of this large island-like structure. So hidden within this casing are all kinds of fans and machinery that would otherwise have been all over the deck and cluttering it up. You can see these big intakes here for sucking in huge amounts of air. Now when she was complete, Chusan's funnel was a fair bit shorter, and it looked totally different. But in a 1952 refit, a Thornycroft funnel cap was added to prevent soot from falling all over the after passenger decks. Another classic Chusan feature here is her name, uh, spelt out uh, either side of the funnel. And at night time, the port side would be illuminated red and the starboard side would be illuminated green. You can also see for dramatic effect these uh, spotlights pointed straight at the funnel. Moving a little more forward here, you can see the fairly distinctive bridge island structure. This is a fairly large four or five story structure that contained the officer's quarters, uh, the captain's stateroom, the bridge, the chart room and what have you. You can see on top here a fairly big array of radar and, and all kinds of things. A compass platform on top of the wheelhouse as well. If you look really carefully here, you're going to see a 10-inch signal projector. Now these were most commonly seen on warships, but they could be used in rough weather to signal to another ship via Morse with flashes of light. But they also served a second purpose where they could be used as a spotlight, and one of her former officers told me that this came in a lot of handy in case someone went overboard at night time. He said though, luckily it didn't happen on Chusan. We're going to have a look down here just above the bilge keel at what really was one of Chusan's great technological additions, and this was the patent Denny Brown Stabilizer. You might know these from being installed on ships like Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth later in their careers, but in 1950 Chusan was actually the first large passenger ship to enter service with these stabilizing fins. These were driven by servos and a velocity gyro, and in essence they would automatically correct if she listed too far. Now into her sea trials, the ship was tested and rolled 35 degrees either side using the stabilizing fins. The fins then worked to absolutely kill the roll immediately. So they worked very well. Now this was really important because the Indian Ocean can get fairly rough. You can see here up on the forecastle two more massive cargo hatches. There's actually a third one just behind this bulwark. All in all, a very pretty ship, uh, an extremely functional one, but a, a really a beautiful liner. Today she's commemorated on stamps for some of the places that she stopped, like Singapore for example. She's even on a banknote. So this ship, even though she's not the most famous, had a huge impact during her life and times. One reason I really wanted to make this video was because of my friend, someone I'd been writing to for a couple of years, Mr. Ken Beard. He was a fourth engineer on board Chusan in the 1950s. Ken gave me a brilliant account of his time at sea, what it was like to work down in the stokehole of a massive ship like this. I wrote a series of articles about him. If you're really interested in this, you should go and check them out, because Ken's story is so typical of any engineer of any ship at the time. But he was brilliant because of the way that he could remember really obscure technical details. At one point, he basically gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to drive an ocean liner. Even in his later years, Ken couldn't stay away from the sea, and his preferred choice of line was, of course, P&O. I got word a little earlier this year that unfortunately Ken had passed away, and I was really sad to hear that. But I hope this drawing serves as some kind of small memorial to him and his colleagues. Well that's it from me today, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you'd like to have a closer look at the drawing or buy a copy for a print, visit my website oceanlinerdesigns.com slash chusan. If you enjoy these have a look around videos, why not recommend what ship to do next? I can never really make up my mind on which one. Go check out my website and pick a ship that I've drawn and I'll give you guys a guided tour. As always, thanks for watching, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time.